I think I'll, I'll start. Thank you all for, for coming, first of all, and um, speak about uh, Irish, Welsh, and Scottish Gaelic, three Celtic languages. I begin with two little anecdotes, first of all. One is my, with my second daughter. She was born in, in Warsaw when I worked in Poland at the Irish Embassy. And for, she was three when we moved back to Ireland. And I spoke Irish to her always from birth. So she's a native speaker of, of Irish and her mother spoke French to her. And she learned Polish from everybody else in the surroundings. So she, her Polish was quite good. Uh, well, like a three-year-old who spoke Polish. But, um, so we moved back to Ireland and she went to school an Irish-speaking school in Ireland, and at the end of the first day, I, I spoke to her, asked her in Irish, um, how do you like your new school? She says, horrible, don't like it at all. I says, why? Oh, the people here are horrible, awful people. I said, how, how do you mean, awful? She said, uh, every one of them, without exception, they all pretend not to understand Polish. Because having been born in Warsaw, where everybody spoke Polish, suddenly she tried to speak Polish to people in Ireland and discovered everybody, they didn't understand, but she thought they were pretending not to understand. They uh, said so they must understand Polish because everybody understands Polish because the country she was born in, everybody did understand Polish. 40 million people or something, so. And this is one, one little story. And another story was uh, about Wales. Um, there was a policeman in Wales from an English-speaking part of Wales and he was moved the Welsh-speaking part of Wales, as you know, Wales, uh, the Welsh language is very strong. It's used a lot more than Irish, and the whole north and west of the country speaks Welsh. But the policeman didn't speak any Welsh, and he was moved to a station in a Welsh-speaking area, and he was called into his inspector on his first day on the job, and the inspector said one of the first questions was, well, do you speak Welsh? He spoke none at all. He didn't understand any, but he felt ashamed to admit that he couldn't speak any Welsh, so he decided to say something else, he said, well, I don't speak well, she said, but I, I understand it. It wasn't true. The inspector said, interesting, he said, I have a dog just like that. <laughs> My dog understands Welsh, but he doesn't speak. <laughs> so a few words about what Celtic languages have in common. Now, we won't be speaking about Breton today. It's, it's probably too much to have four languages, but just three just Welsh, Irish, and Scottish Gaelic, that they're, they're Celtic languages, so they have a different word order that most European languages have subject, verb, object. The Celtic languages are verb first, then subject, then object. So uh, take a simple sentence, she saw a cow. In Irish it would be chynig si bo. So saw she a cow. Chynig si bo. In Welsh, welodd he, View. So you can see how, the, how similar and different they are. Chonik and Welod, quite different. She and he. The Welsh word for she is actually he. So and the Welsh word for, for, for he is, um, is a. He saw, he saw a cow be Welod a vach uh, and uh, she Welod he viuch for a cow. Um, we have what you call uh, mutations at the beginning of words. The beginning of words change, particularly uh, feminine words change at the beginning. So a woman is ban, but the woman on van. Um, and uh, good is ma, but if you say the good woman, it's on van va. So both the uh, ban changes to van and ma changes to va. Both of them have a V sound. Um, and in fact, in Welsh, it's, it's similar. I mean, uh, a goat in Welsh is gavar, but the goat is ur avar. The G just drops, drops away. And that's one of the, the comparisons between Irish and Welsh. Is Welsh is phonetic. It's, you, they write what you hear. And you, hear you, you pronounce every letter the same way. But um, to give an example, the word for mother in the two languages, in mohir in Irish, mam in Welsh, the mother is on vohir, so mohir becomes vohir. The, the M sound becomes a V sound. The same in Welsh, mam, vam. Mohir and vohir, mam, vam. The same change, the M sound changing to a V sound. It's just it's written completely differently. The Irish write the V sound MH, and the Welsh write it with an F. 
So it's completely different. It's a, 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 it's a real kind of two languages which have a lot in common, but they're disguised by their completely different spelling systems. To give one more example, the, the nose, for instance. In Irish, a throne. In Welsh, a truin. But the Irish is spelled T S R O for the O accent, N, T S R O N. And the Welsh, T R W Y N. So, truin, throne. They sound very sim similar, but when you see W and Y are not used in Irish, and they're used all the time in Welsh, W, Y, all over the place. So, I mean, somebody, an Irish speaker, looks at Welsh for the first time, he says, completely different. It looks like no similarity at all. But when you start to learn it, it's, um, it's uh, far more similar. It's, it's <coughs> Scottish Gaelic is very similar to Irish, whereas Welsh is about as, it's the same family, but it's about as different as English and German. It's no more close than that. Um, all of the Catholic languages then, they have no verb to have. So in order to say, I have a book, you say, or I have a phone, Taugahan Agum, you say, there is a phone at me, literally. And the same, the same is in Russian, Umunya, like a, a book, Umunya Kniga, Talaur Agum, in Irish. And in Welsh, my Shiver Genevi, my Ta, that there is. Then, Laur in Irish, Shiver in Welsh, and Genevi Agom, Agom at me, um, Genevi in, in Welsh. Then you have a book, Ta Laur Agut, Ta Laur Agom, Ta Laur Agut. The last letter tells you who has the book. Ta Laur Agom, Ta Laur Agut, Umiña Kniga, Utibia Kniga. So, Ta Laur Agom, Ta Laur Agut, in Welsh, my Shiver Genevi, my Shiver Geneti. So, Genevi Geneti. So, again, it's a Similar, um, you wouldn't guess it probably if you didn't know the, the, the word um, shiver, you wouldn't guess it from, from Ljaur. But uh, then we have what I mentioned earlier on the prepositional pronouns. We combine a pronoun and a, and a, and a preposition. So in, Welsh you say, in English you say at me, at me, at you. You don't come with the two words, at me. They combine the nouns, at me, at is egg, me is me. You never say egg me, never, it doesn't exist. You have to say agum. This combines into one word. At you is be egg and tu, tu is you, but at you, a gut. These, these words combine together. They, they, there are lots of them. My position is one of the difficulties. In the Celtic languages, also in Arabic and Hebrew, not in, in continental languages otherwise. So it's a, I have a little book at home, uh, 40 resemblances between Celtic languages and the one that take Irish and Breton and on the other hand, Hebrew and Arabic. So they call it Celtic, it's a book in Esperanto, but it's a French version of it too. It's called the uh, Celt Semido Lingvoi in Esperanto, the, the um, Celtic Semitic languages. And it, the writer who's French, André Charpillot, he's found 40 resemblances, 40 between Celtic languages and the Arabic and Hebrew and the other. So it's, uh, he said himself, I mean, I know him reasonably well, he said that he could find four or five resemblances and maybe a coincidence, but 40, it's a lot of coincidence. It's, it's difficult to imagine that all 40 similarities are, are a coincidence. Um, turning to Welsh a little bit, um, Welsh is, is the strongest of the Celtic languages, spoken every day by at least 600,000 people. So even though Wales is closer to England, and in some ways it's integrated in England far more, it's, every part of Wales is only a few hours by train from London. But the language is really strong in, in West Wales and in the north and west of the, of the country. Just to give you an idea of what, what Welsh sounds like. Um, I'm not a very good singer, but I'll have a stab at it. Because I think if, if you hear something sung, it, it penetrates at a better level. The Welsh national anthem, it's called Henlad Vanale, the old land of my fathers. It's not only in Welsh. It sings about the language. It's the only anthem I know that actually sings about the language. The, the ending of the language is, as long as, uh, as Wales is beside the sea, then may the old language endure, may the old language continue to be spoken. They, they said the old language for Welsh, uh, or hen, la, uh, hen iaith. Hen is, is old, and, and hen iaith, old language, hen lad, the old country, hen lad vanade. So this is the way it sounds in, in Welsh. It's, um, so it, it's sung at uh, rugby matches by, by huge crowds in Wales, and all, all are sung in Welsh. Or something like this. My hen ulad vanad ayun anu ilimi 
Clad by the Hantorian and Wogion of Re, a Gurul Ravel were clad car were trammed, Dras Ravid, Cochlasant a Guide. Glad, glad, plaid yal with him glad. Tramor on vir, ir beer hof by, o bothered, ir hen yath bar high. Tramor on vir, ir beer hof by, o bothered, ir hen yath bar high. As Norse is a bit, a bit high in the high side, but as I said, they, they, they repeat this, the Hainyai, the, the language. So it's a, Wales, is, it's very different to Scotland. Scotland has its own legal system and its own juries and laws and educational system. It's a lot different from England. Uh, whereas Wales is almost everything in common with England, except the language. It's the one distinguishing characteristic is, is the language. The language is probably stronger than anything else because if an Englishman travels to Scotland, he understands people. And he, maybe the educational system is a bit different, and maybe juries, juries can have three verdicts. They have guilty, not guilty, and not proven. There's only two verdicts in England. They have three verdicts in Scotland. There are lots of differences like that, but they don't bother. But an Englishman who goes to Welsh Wales, he understands nothing at all. Everybody's speaking in Welsh, and he's completely lost. Because uh, from English, it's, it's, it's miles away. It's a completely, completely different language. Um, instead of saying, how are you, they say, satachi. Satachi. Um, I'm well, uh, I'm very well, thank you. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, you can get nothing at all from, from, from English. Prince of Wales doesn't speak Welsh, did he? He learned some Welsh. <laughs> he was the first Prince of Wales to learn some Welsh in 1969, and it was very controversial because some Welsh were, were very uh, were delighted to have somebody of the royal family learning Welsh. They were very happy, and others said that um, he should speak it fluently. It's not enough at all. It's only a tiny bit he learned, and he should learn far more. Uh, so it was kind of quite. Uh, he, when he became, when he was 21, I think it was back in 1969. There was um, he was installed as Prince of Wales. It was a formal ceremony, but they had a lot of the, the ceremony in, in Welsh because the language is, is very strong. Uh, just to go, uh, regards the numbers of speakers. The 2011 census, 19% claim to be able to speak Welsh. Uh, but um, the annual population survey in March this year showed 896,000, almost 30% claimed the knowledge of Welsh. And then the most recent national survey for Wales, 19% uh, uh, aged 16 or over claimed the knowledge of Welsh and 12% more. So it's, it's somewhere between 25 30%. It's about a quarter to a third of the population who speak it. And in education, Welsh has become compulsory in schools since the year 2000. All schools in Wales teach Welsh. You don't have a choice. You have, if you want to live in Wales, you have to learn Welsh. Even if you come from England or wherever you come from, I mean. And sometimes English people who move to Wales, uh, they learn it very well indeed and, and, and become supporters of the language. I, I can't resist telling a little, um, little anecdote about this. There was a, an Englishman called Keith Best who moved to Wales or about 20 years ago. And he was elected. There were so many English people bought houses along the, the coast of um, Anglesey, the island of Anglesey and, and, and Carnarvon, that, that, that northwest Wales. And he was elected to the local council. Now, the local, local council in, in, in Gwynedd Council had 46 members. And all were Welsh speakers, all 46. So they normally did all their business in Welsh. But he arrived for his first meeting, and he said that he just announced, well, he said, I'm here now. All you guys can speak English. Uh, I don't speak any Welsh, but from now I expect you all to speak English. So I expect that just because he was elected as an Englishman, all the whole council, the other 45 members would just drop the Welsh right away and start using English alone. But um, they, they very politely told him, the chairman of the council said, um, he said, no, it's not as simple as this. He said, you can speak English, of course, by all means, you're free to speak your language. This is no problem for us because we all understand English. But we intend to continue speaking in Welsh, as we always have. If this is a problem for you, then it's up to you to learn Welsh. 
But otherwise, he said, we'll just function uh, in this way, the Jews speak in English, we'll reply in Welsh, and then if you don't understand, too bad. So he, for, first of all, he really protested. He started writing to the newspapers and making speeches and talking about Nazism and imposing a language on him, and he had a, expected everybody to speak English. But they didn't give in. They just went down quietly, politely, but speaking Welsh all the time. So after about six months, he, he gave up. He spent about six months trying to, to force them to use English. Then they wouldn't budge. And then he decided to learn Welsh. And he learned it, learned it very well. And when he learned the language, he became one of the strongest defenders of the Welsh language. But if the Welsh at the beginning, if they had all switched to English, first of all, he would never have learned Welsh. Secondly, he would always have been against the language. So by, by holding firm, by speaking their own language, by refusing to switch to English, they won one convert to the language. An Englishman who was completely Englishman, Keith Best, he became one of the strongest supporters of the Welsh language. But um, when I, I did a course, several courses in Welsh, the first time I arrived in Wales, I remember there, there'd been a, a postal strike in Ireland, so I didn't have the address of where the course was, was happening. I only had one address. So I went along there on the Monday morning, it was a tiny office. I said, well, the course is clearly not here. Wherever else it is, it's not here because there was room for two people to stand up in, the, in a tiny office. So I said that I wanted to do a, what they call Kurs Kalam Cymbraig, um, an intensive course in Welsh. As soon as I spoke the three words of Welsh, they explained to me in Welsh how I could find the course. I had to get a bus for about two kilometers out the road. I had to get off the bus and climb a, a hill. And then on the other side of the hill, there was a, the College of Further Education, the, the Colleg Aziz Bechlach in Welsh. Uh, and um, I'd never spoken Welsh, but they insisted on explaining to me in Welsh how I could find the course. They would not do it in English. I mean, they had to maybe say it five times before I began to understand what they were saying. But they would not explain it in English. They said, if you were here to learn Welsh, we just speak to you in Welsh right from the beginning. So even to explain where the course was, they did this in Wales. And I mean, it meant that I actually, I found the course. And I was delighted because I said, well, I really understood it, and now I found the course. And it was explained to me only in Welsh. So um, I said, but this wouldn't happen in Ireland. In Ireland, people would switch to English right away as soon as, even if somebody would reasonably good Irish, as soon as they hear that you have any problem at all with speaking Irish, they just switch to English right away. So there's, there's one, one real difference between Ireland and Wales. Even though Ireland is independent and Wales isn't, the strength of, of Welsh is much, much stronger. It's much, uh, and there's a loyalty to the language that, unfortunately, very few people, some people in Ireland have it, a small minority, but the majority of Irish don't, don't have this, this, this loyalty. Um, then as regards media, there's been a Welsh television station since 1982. Uh, Pedwarek, which, which functions in Welsh, and there's a Welsh uh, radio, uh, Radio Cymru. You can get it on the internet. So they, they, they speak in Welsh all the time. So it's, it's quite a, a, a healthy situation. It's far more healthy than, than any of the Celtic languages. I remember the, the first television station in Irish started in 1996. So Welsh was 14 years earlier. And I remember that period from 1982 to 80 to 96. You, would, you could get the Welsh TV in, in Dublin, in the east coast of Ireland, you could easily get Welsh TV. I got many taxi men saying to me that, look, the Welsh have got their own television system, why don't we have this in Irish? So it had a real knock-on effect in Ireland. People started to say, well, we should have TV in Irish, we're an independent country, we've got no television in Irish. Wales isn't independent, but they've got TV in Welsh. So, I mean, right away, people, in, and on Saturdays, you hear a lot of Welsh spoken because People in the west of Wales, the closest big city to them is Dublin. So they just get the boat across, it's just two hours across. And they do the shopping in Dublin, so on the, the little train, the dart train, going from Dunlera to the city centre in Dublin, you hear a lot of people speaking Welsh. You hear more Welsh than Irish there, I have to admit. Uh, so it's, it, it's uh, even in Ireland you can, you, can, you can hear Welsh on the east coast um, spoken. Now to move to Scottish Gaelic, if, if Welsh, Welsh is stronger than Irish, Scottish Gaelic is the other extreme. It's a lot weaker than Irish. It's, um, it's a Celtic language. Again, it's, it's much closer to Irish as regards languages. I mean, I did a course in Scottish Gaelic. I only took four days to be able to speak it. I mean, I arrived on a Sunday and by, by Thursday I could speak it. Now, I had I'd learned how to read it uh, before going there. But it's very, very close. And up to 1800, they were the same literary language, the, the Irish Bible was used in Scotland. It was actually written in the Irish of Ireland and then printed in, in Scotland in 1567. And it was used in both countries then up to 1800. 
1800, then they wrote their own Bible in, in Scottish Gaelic, but they're very, very close uh, as regards languages. And then a word on the terminology. Um, if you buy a book called Teach Yourself Gaelic, this will teach you Scottish Gaelic. If you want to learn Irish, the book is called Teach Yourself Irish. But Americans call the two languages Gaelic. They, they, they just mix them up and they just say the, the, the Americans say Gaelic for the two or sometimes they say Irish Gaelic and Scottish Gaelic. I've had off lots of people in, in German as well, they say um, Irish Gaelish. There's no need to say that, it's like saying English Germanic. Uh, Irish is one of the Gaelic languages, but Irish, Scottish Gaelic and Manx are three Gaelic languages. But calling it Irish Gaelic is like saying English, English Germanic. English is a Germanic language, but you know it's a Germanic language, you don't have to repeat all the time. It's, it's, a, it's a tautology. But there are people in Ireland who don't like the language and they almost insist on saying Gaelic. They're a tiny minority. The average person always is Irish. The Irish language is the constitution. It's called just Irish, the Irish language. But it, um, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, of course. So it, so it's Scottish Gaelic. Scottish Gaelic. And is there any other Gaelic? Manx, but they don't, they don't say Manx Gaelic. They just say Manx. The Isle of Man. Okay. They just say Manx. So if someone says Gaelic, could you say it's he means Scottish Gaelic? Yes. If you normally, if you buy, buy if you buy the book, teaches of Gaelic, it teaches you Scottish Gaelic. Um, but uh, to finish on the language terminology, up to about 1500, uh, Scottish Gaelic was called Scottish, simply. Just like in Ireland it's called Irish, in Scotland it was called Scottish. And what they called as a, a third language in Scotland, Lowland Scots. This was called English. Up to 1500 it was called English. Now it's called Scots. It, they changed, they, for about 1500 they stopped calling Gaelic Scottish, and they started calling this English, which is it's a language, it's like English. It's cl quite close to English. It's a Germanic language and in fact, it's very, very close to English. A lot of, just some words are different. They don't say church, they say kirk. They don't say child, they say bern. Instead of a little child, they say wee bern. Uh, they have some words which are different, but I mean, Robbie Burns wrote in this language. I mean, and instead of two, they say toi. Uh, but um, it's very close to English, but it's, it's called Scots now and, and uh, Gaelic is, is Scottish Gaelic or just, just, just Gaelic. Or sometimes they say Gaelic. The, 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 the Scottish Gaelic word for the language is Gaelic. The Irish word for Irish is Gaelga. So Gaelga, Gaelic. They're, they're, they're quite similar and as regards uh, that. Uh, let's see. A few words comparing Scottish Gaelic and Irish. Um, in pronunciation, Scottish Gaelic is more conservative. It, it's, it's maintained some of the older sounds which have disappeared in Ireland. But in the, in the morphology, Irish, Irish is much more conservative. And particularly the south, my dialect of Irish, the south of Ireland, is much more conservative. We, we, we have older farms which have died out in Scotland. So, um, like say, I was, and where I come from, we'd say vias, we've one word, vias. In the rest of Ireland, the western north, they say vime, and in Scotland, they say vami. So vias, vime, vami. Um, just to give it, uh, one example of it, whereas the sounds are, are much more, um, much more conservative in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, again, to turn it to maybe to songs that you hear, what's, what Scottish Gaelic sounds like. It's a little song about um, a girl who's missing her, her boyfriend. He's joined the army and he's gone into the navy, and she sings uh, about him that um, she's missing him and she's sad because he's gone. But she also sings that. Uh, she hears stories that he's being very silly, that he's, he's drunk, he's being in pubs and he's drunk too much and, and, and he, he lost his socks and his shoes on one occasion. And she says, uh, this, how, how, can I, how can I marry a man who's so silly, who does these things, who gets drunk and who loses his shoes and this kind of thing. So it's a, it's, it's a bit of a funny song. It's a, it sounds like this in Scottish Gaelic. It's, um, Goran oros gatailum hino, stailum hino, slum is bacha, blasna hamjala, erdo fogan, pimigat hio, ne rein ho sholag. Goran oros gatailum hino, svada svada, svada falav hu, a long rejar sled a hot deragarst. Garben gul lechila hugshin, raged ye me hoderatulich, Coronoro 
A little song in Scottish Gaelic. Yeah. When I had the course in, in Stornoway, we, we learned several songs in, in Scottish Gaelic. Some of them are uh, very beautiful and they, um, they're sung quite a, quite a lot. But um, the, the relationship is quite complex between the two countries. I mean, Irish spread to Scotland about the, somewhere about the 5th century, 4th, 5th century. So a place called Dal Riada in one corner of Scotland, first of all, and then it gradually spread to the, to the Picts of Scotland. And then Scotland was united for the first time under a, a king called Kenneth MacAlpin, who spoke Gaelic. And then little by little, the Pictish language died out and was replaced by Gaelic. And um, the language was used in, eventually in all Scotland. Edinburgh was called Dunedin. The old name for Edinburgh was Dunedin. And Dun is a fortress in Irish or Scottish. It's the same word. Uh, um, there's a legend in Scotland, you hear some Scots saying that uh, because uh, the language disappeared much earlier from the south or from the southeast of Scotland, there were some who believed that it was never spoken there. And especially particularly people will tell you that in, around Edinburgh, around the Lothians, the southeast corner of Scotland, that the language of Gaelic was never spoken there. I flew there because my da daughter studied for four years in Glasgow. I flew to Scotland, just got a bus from the airport to the city centre, and I looked at the place names. In a 10-minute bus journey, I saw five place names which clearly came from Irish. Words like Acha, Dún, Baile, purely Irish. So I mean, if it was never spoken there, it's very strange <laughs> that they should name their places after a language they never spoke. <laughs> it's like, I mean, can you imagine the Austrians naming, naming several villages in Hungarian, even though they never spoke Hungarian? <laughs> uh, so it's, it, it, it's, uh, to my mind, the fact that you have place names in, in all of Scotland it shows clearly that Gaelic was spoken at different times in all of Scotland. It's probably true that it was never spoken in all of Scotland at the same time. But it was spoken at different times in different places. So that's because the place names are right up to the border. In fact, uh, in the, um, the, the late 7th century, there was a king of Northumbria, in the north of England, who was, who was a fluent speaker of, 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 uh, of Irish, as it was even called Irish at the time, or Gaelic. He actually wrote poetry because he studied in Iona. He was called Alfred in, in, in Saxon. Alfred, but in, in Irish, he wrote under the name Flan Fianna in Irish. And he wrote poetry, which we can still read. Still excellent uh, today. And he was king of Northumbria in the north of England. So it went as far as the north of England, let alone all of Scotland, but even the north of England uh, had a king who spoke Irish, basically. So it's, uh, it, it went that, that far. But then it declined, it started to decline in the 11th century already. The King of Scotland married a Saxon princess who refused to learn the language. And she imposed a, a, a dialect of English in the court so that English became the language of the court and then gradually the nobility started to use it and um, Gaelic was pushed aside much, much sooner than in Ireland. So that, um, that's why you get, you get uh, people believing that it wasn't spoken in, in the south of Scotland despite the evidence of the place names. Um, so now the latest, the 2011 census showed just 57,000 speakers of Scottish Gaelic. So it's just 1.1% of the population. So it's really down to 1%. And most of them live on the, on the islands, on the, the, the Hebrides, the Lewis and Harris and North Oost, South Oost, Barra, um, Skye, um, the, all these islands on the northwest of Scotland. Very few speak it on the, on the mainland. But there are new schools in Glasgow and Edinburgh now teaching through Gaelic. It's a, it's a new phenomenon, like because of the, the Scottish National Party won the elections and began, have won several elections, and nationalism has been getting stronger in Scotland, and the Scottish National Party promotes the language to some extent. So you get, uh, I noticed, for instance, in Glasgow, you know, there's a lot of bilingual signs. Uh, you have Queen Street and Sradna Bonriana, and the signs are so close to Irish. I mean, the main bus station in Glasgow you have an exit sign on the way out, exit, and it's in about four or five languages. But the second language, after English, exit, English is amach. 
Amach is out. It's out in Irish and it's out in Scottish. It's exactly the same word. So I mean, I arrived there for the first time. Look at the signs. Amach, heavens, huge sign in Irish at the main bus station in Glasgow in Scotland. So I was surprised. I mean, to me, I realized, of course, it was Scottish Gaelic, but uh, that particular word is exactly the same. There are many words which are exactly the same in Irish and Scottish Gaelic. So, so that's why you can pick it up very, very quickly. Um, but as I say, it's uh, only 1% of native, native speakers. But a friend of mine showed me around the Scottish Parliament. And it's really, everything is bilingual. Everything, every brochure, every sign, everything is in English and, and Scottish Gaelic. Not in Scots, not in the Slalands. Strange enough. And I asked him, first question, of course, is why is it not in this third language, in this Lalands or the language you call Scots? He said, because there are different varieties. There's one variety spoken in Glasgow, one variety in Aberdeen, another in Dundee, another in, in Glasgow, and they would never agree as to which should be used. At least Scottish Gaelic is it's one standardized version. Just, there's only one word, one way of saying a thing, and, and, and use this. So the, that's an advantage, at least, that it's, uh, Scottish Gaelic is used. Uh, on the media, there is a, a television session now in, uh, in uh, it's called BBC Al Alba. It's uh, since 2008, so it's much later than Irish and later, later than Welsh, far later than Welsh. 1982 for Welsh, 1996 for Irish, 2008, television in Scottish Gaelic, at least. So it's called BBC Alba. Alba is the, the Scottish Gaelic word for Scotland, Alba. Alba. And um, Radio Nangail, you have a Gaelic language uh, station, uh, radio station as well. In the schools, it's not compulsory. It's not like Welsh, so everybody has to learn it. Um, in 2018, there were uh, 4,300 students were learning through Scottish Gaelic. Now, the, the, this, this medium of instruction, the, those learning the language would be, would be higher. But of the total, those learning through Scottish Gaelic, it's 0.63%. So it's a little less than, a little more than half of 1%. But it's, it's increased because in, in uh, 2015, it was only 0 0.35. So even though it's very, very small, it's increasing at the moment. So I mean, there's, there's still some hope for it. And one of the major differences I find between um, Scottish Gaelic and Irish, well, one or two differences, is um, first of all, Scottish Gaelic has more English loan words. They're, they're more open to loan words. Would, for instance, teachers and nurses in Scottish Gaelic, they're called teacheran agus nursican. Teachers and nurses. In Irish, we would say muntori agus banal tri. So we were kind of more native terms in, in Irish. We, there's a strong resistance in Irish to, to using English terms. It's, uh, that is stronger. Even though the use of English itself is not resisted, but the use of English words in Irish is more, more resistant, not too resistant in Scotland. But um, the other I wanted to mention was um, The, um, the use, yeah, the, exactly. The, I mentioned earlier on about the, the Welsh insisting on telling me where the course was in Welsh. Now, the Scottish Gaelic in the course I did there was exactly the opposite. Even the teachers, it was difficult to get them to speak Gaelic all the time. I mean, I, 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 my natural thing was to I speak Irish all the time in Ireland, so the thing was once, as soon as I could speak Gaelic, I wanted to use it all the time. I said, the more I use it, the better it gets. So I didn't want to switch to English at all. I said, let's, let's speak it all the time. And we kind of we got talking about European integration and things. They said, ah, well, we've never spoken about European integration in, in Scottish Gaelic. We, we don't have the terminology. They said, we speak about kind of homely things and farm and, and the surrounding area. We don't speak about uh, international politics and European integration in, in Gaelic. We, we, we just, this, we, we, normally we've always spoken about this in English. So I, I more or less insisted, let's try to speak even Gaelic about it. And they, they did, they tried, but they, they found it quite difficult. So they get the opposite of the Welsh speaking, even in Welsh, even to somebody who hasn't done a course, they explain to, to the person where the, what the course is in Welsh. So they use so much Welsh, they couldn't use more, whereas the Scots Gaelic, not just, even the teachers weren't comfortable using it all the time then, to, to discuss everything. So it's a much, much weaker situation than so many people I'd meet on the road and say hello to them, and they say hello to them in Scottish Gaelic, or say, Kimmer uh, Hashiv, and they switch, ah, you're learning Gaelic, and they switch to English right away. And you almost have to force them to speak their own language. They're, they're kind of ashamed or there's something there. They're shy about using their own language to, to strangers. And you, you're really in a position where you're kind of forcing them to use their own language. So it's so, they've been beaten so much. I mean, the, it's bad in Ireland, but it's much worse in Scotland. <laughs> this kind of uh, defeatism of uh, having lost so many battles. And on one occasion, one of the teachers was telling me that 
one of the Scottish Gaelic teachers. He went out for a, for a drink with two friends of his in a pub. And they were just sitting in a corner chatting in Scottish Gaelic. And a woman came over to him, a woman they didn't know, and spoke to him in English, but they could tell from her English that she was a native speaker of Gaelic. And she said, uh, would you mind stop, to stop speaking this language? Because I'm expecting some friends from England and they might get offended if they hear a language here which isn't English. So I mean, that a stranger would actually, as a stranger, you'd walk over to three people you don't know and say, please stop speaking this language. We know you can speak English as well and just switch to English. It shows how incredible that they wanted to hide the language away from the, from the, from the English visitors. The opposite happens in Wales. I mean, sometimes uh, English people in Wales, they say that I got the impression that we were all using English and when I walked in, they all switched to Welsh so that I would no longer understand. Now, this is an impression they have. I think in reality, they were speaking Welsh all the time. They are bilingual in Wales. I mean, everybody in Wales can speak English, but they do speak Welsh. In Scotland, they, 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 in Scottish Gaelic areas, they, they can speak the two languages, but they rarely use uh, Gaelic. One of the reasons it didn't die out is because the Gaelic-speaking areas have become Protestant. They've become Presbyterian. So they have this church services on, on Sunday in, in, in Gaelic. In, 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 I say Gaelic mostly because it's what they say, call themselves. And so you go to the church, and you get the Bible and the Bible in Gaelic. I bought one when I was there. I have it at home in Scottish Gaelic as well. It's a beautiful translation, really beautiful. But they have to sing hymns and everything is in Gaelic in the church. So this gave it a certain prestige. Um, and the language had a prestige in Wales as well because Wales turned Protestant very early and they had a Welsh Bible and they had Welsh Sunday school. And we didn't have this in Ireland. Ireland stayed Catholic. Because of this, the language of prestige in the church was Latin. So we had all the hymns in Latin and the language uh, used in church was Latin. So Irish was, was removed from one of the uh, prestigious areas. Uh, now I think uh, time is moving on, so I should say a few words about Irish, which is the, the, the language I know best of the two. I left it till last because I probably would speak too much about it, but maybe just again, so that you hear the difference between Irish and Scots Gaelic, a little song in Irish. It's a, a song called Eamon uh, Eamon of the Hill, Eamon O'Chanik in Irish. This is a historic song. It's about 300 years old. It was the war of the two kings in England, King William and King James. When King James was one of the last of the Stuart kings, he was a Catholic. And the English were prepared to tolerate one Catholic king. They didn't like it, but they said, well, he'll die and we'll replace him with a Protestant, so that'll be okay. But then in 1688, his son was born. And the son, of course, would be a Catholic as well. And immediately there was a rebellion. As soon as his son was born, the English rebelled. And they said, no, we do not want a Catholic dynasty. We will put up with one Catholic king, certainly not with two. So they, they, they rebelled and they invited the, um, William of Orange from Holland to come to England and become their king. Now, William spoke no English, no connection. Much, well, he had an English wife, but otherwise he didn't speak English. But he was Protestant. And they didn't really mind that he wasn't English. He had to be Protestant. They accepted George, King George of, of Saxony as well. He spoke only German, didn't mind about that, but he was a Protestant, which was the only important thing for them. They said no Catholic as a king in England. So they, in 1688, they, they got rid of the king, and there was a war between the two kings, and King James of Stuart and King William had a war to decide who would be king of England. Of course, they had their war in Ireland. Both of them moved to Ireland, and the war took place in Ireland from 1690 to 1691. There were several major battles in Ireland. The French supported the, the uh, King James, the Catholic king. French sent soldiers to Ireland. Of course, all the Irish supported the Catholic king. And then the, some Germans and, and Dutch supported the Protestant king. And the Protestant king won the battle, the Battle of the Boyne in 1690. Uh, they still celebrate this uh, 12th of July every year. Um, and um, the um, Protestant side won. But one of the consequences of this was that the Catholics, the Catholic landowners who supported the Catholic king, they all lost their land. And there was a, a guy in Tipperary, where I come from, called Eamon O'Rean. He's the same name as me, like Sean O'Rean, Eamon O'Rean. He owned quite a bit of land. He supported the, the Catholic king. He supported the wrong king in the war. He lost, his side lost, so he lost all his land. He was declared an outlaw, lost all of his land. And this song is, he comes along to his girlfriend's house and knocks on the door, and she's afraid to open the door. because She's so terrified that she said, the, the English have declared you an outlaw, they're shooting at you. If I help you, they'll shoot both of us. 
So she said, sorry, I'm not opening the door. I want to stay safe. Not a very, not a very noble. Um, so, and then he just turns away and goes away sadly, saying that uh, I'll try to leave the country because everybody is um, even afraid to help me here in Ireland now at, uh, at present. Uh, we're, we're on the, the wrong side. The English have won and, and everybody is terrified of the English to even help uh, any, any Irish rebels at this stage. So um, this is what the song sounds like. I mean, he knocks on the door and he says, who's that outside? <clears throat> so it goes like this. Kehe <laughs> The Maguna Skowil Puder Gotiv Ahir Hedel Yat is come a mission Muchta Sfada Misha Mo Feich Nachta Sfeyuk Skanda Nachta Gum Erenyach Mo Heshrach Ganskar Smo Vranar Gankar is cani the gum in a her nil carried a gum is tanned lam son a lacach me moch no de nach is cogahi medal har farigasir o sound nafulean dem welta. It's a, it's a sad song because the Emin Ochnik Emin Orion was eventually killed because the, the English gave a huge reward for him, a reward. It was a couple of thousand pounds at the time. It would have been like half a million in today's money. And uh, a relative of his killed him and brought along, he's cut his head off, brought his head along to the English and the English said, sorry, <laughs> it's too late. There was a closing date. <laughs> it was last week, so we won't pay you any money. And he, even though he killed his cousin, he got no money from the English. They were clever in these things. They, they, they would offer a reward, but they'd have fine print. You have to do it by a certain date, and if you don't, you get no money. So, I mean, they got this man killed for, for free, basically. One, one rebel less. Um, I wanted to say a quick few words about Irish. I mean, it's, it's a, a very old um, literary language, a literary language from the end of the sixth century. There was a text in Irish from the year um, 597, the, the um, Lament for the death of, of St. Colum Killa, uh, who uh, um, was the first Irish born saint. He died in 597. And there was a lament for him, for him right away. He lived mostly in Iona. He moved, he moved uh, because he caused a battle. There was a row over a book. Somebody made a copy of a book, or he made a copy of a book. And there was a row over who, who should own the book, then the person who owned the original book, and the person who made the copy. Colm Kille had made the coffee and the, the judge decided that he said la mach gach boa le le gach leor a mach leor that every calf belongs to its mother and every copy belongs to the original book so he said the, the book should belong to the, the person who has the original book because with the same Colm Kille had gone to the trouble of copying the whole book he was really annoyed so he declared war on the other side and there was a battle because of this and he got back his book by force but several thousands were killed in the battle. And then he got really sorry. He saw all these people killed. He decided to punish himself because nobody else could punish him because he belonged to the most powerful tribe in Ireland. Uh, so he decided he'd punish himself. And the punishment he could think of worse than the death penalty was to exile himself from Ireland and never see Ireland again. So he said he would get in a boat with 12 of his followers and they would sail north until they could no longer see Ireland. And then they started, settled on the first island they saw, which was the island of Iona, and set up a monastery there, and um, started to convert Christianized Scotland from that monastery. So they gradually um, converted Scotland to Christianity from that, from that monastery in Iona. And for a long time, all the kings of Scotland were buried in Iona uh, for several centuries, That's, um, that area. But the language uh, was a majority language in Ireland until, say, 1850. Then you had the huge, the great famine, 1845 to 1849, between 
between one and two million people died of hunger. At the time, uh, the British Empire was the biggest empire in the world. It was rolled from London. It had Canada, it had Australia, it had huge resources. It could have prevented people dying of hunger in Ireland, but for some reason or other, it didn't. They, they, not really because of hatred of the Irish, I think, because it was, um, they believed in real laissez-faire economics. They said that the government shouldn't interfere in the economy. If people die of hunger, then that's, that's the law of the market. The market has to prevail. And um, so people died of hunger and several immigration started and the language really declined from then on. So that by the end of the 19th century, only 3% spoke Irish. But at this stage, then a guy called Douglas Hyde who was, I always, I always emphasize he was English, he was, he was a Protestant of English descent. He made a speech about the necessity for de-anglicizing Ireland. And this started a new movement to prevent the language being lost. And this changed the whole outlook of the Irish people. So that 30 years later, the Irish fought for independence and gained independence. So by, by starting a language movement, he created a new country. And the, the new country, even though it's not an Irish-speaking country yet in any case, it, it, it did prevent the language disappearing. For instance, the first Irish parliament in 1919, 21st of January 1919, only Irish was spoken, which meant that the 10% who spoke Irish spoke, and the 90% who only spoke English voluntarily remained silent. They just said, well, it would be wrong to speak the language of the conqueror in a free parliament. So they said silent for this. And then they declared independence formally in three languages, first in Irish, then in French, and only third in English. And then for more than 50 years, Irish diplomatic passports were only in two languages, from 1922 to 1984, in Irish and in French. There was no English in them at all. English was just excluded from the Irish diplomatic passport. And there was a president of Ireland in the 1970s, Carol O'Dolig, who spoke fluent French. And on an official visit to Paris uh, at a press conference, he said, I will reply to questions in Irish or in French. In nothing else, he said. So basically all the French journalists could ask him lots of questions. He replied in perfect French. The Irish-speaking journalists could ask him questions in Irish and he replied in Irish. But the English-speaking journalists from Dublin or from the east of Ireland couldn't ask their president questions because they only spoke English. They didn't have good Irish, they had no French. And there was their president saying, sorry, the national language of Ireland is Irish. I replied to questions in Irish. We're in France, so I speak French. Let's speak in French. But there's no need for English here. And he just said he wouldn't, he wouldn't be using English. Um, as simple as that. So today, uh, um, the number of, first of all, in the schools, everybody, Irish has become obligatory. The first decision of the first independent Irish government, 1922, it wasn't concerning economics or transport or, or fisheries or agriculture, it concerned language. It was that all schools, all children in all schools would study Irish for one hour a day in all primary schools and secondary schools. That was made in 1922, and it's, it's in force up to, the, up, to, up to the present. All children learn the language in school. But the language, it's just not as a subject in most schools. But language, schools which teach everything through Irish, what we call Gaelskolina. Uh, these, they have been increasing. They were only 2% 40 years ago, now they're up to 8%. So it's still a small minority, but it's four times as much as it was 40 years ago. And it's growing, and the re most recent survey showed that 23% of parents would like to send their children to Irish-speaking schools. So it is, it is growing. It's still a minority overall in the country, but it is growing. And I, I should mention in passing that in Northern Ireland, there's been no government for the past two and a half years just because of a language quarrel, because the, the Catholic side of the population insists that there should be a law to protect the Irish language, and the Democratic Unionist Party say never, they prefer to have no government rather than to have a, a pass a law protecting the Irish language. In fact, they, they, they go even further. The Westminster Parliament, the, the Democratic Unionist Party, Unionist Party is very conservative and it's against uh, gay marriage, it's against uh, abortion. And the Parliament in Westminster passed a law in July that try, trying to, con, con, to encourage the Northern Irish Party to come back together and to, to reconstitute the, the Assembly in Northern Ireland and then they can pass laws for Northern Ireland, but they have to get together and come back into Parliament. They have been boycotting Parliament for two and a half years just because they're fighting over a language law. One side saying, yes, we have to have a language law. The other saying, never. There will never be a language law here. So you a complete clash between the two sides on languages. But the British Westminster Parliament passed the law. In 15 minutes, they passed the law in July, uh, applying, saying that Northern Ireland now will have abortion in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy and gay marriage 
would be allowed unless the Northern Ireland pa Parliament comes back before the end of October and uh, nullifies these laws. So they have a chance. They can nullify these two laws. They just have to come back, get together again, and they can nullify them through the gay marriage and the abortion laws if they want to. But there was a law, I read an article yesterday saying that they, they're against abortion, they're against me, me a marriage, but they hate Irish even more than any of these. They prefer to continue the quarrel and allow abortion to go through, even though they don't like abortion. They'll allow it to go through, they'll allow gay marriage to go through, but the strongest, what they hate more than anything else is the Irish language. They hate the Irish language more than they're against abortion or against gay marriage and everything else. It shows how strong that it's basically, it's a, it's a party founded on hate, hatred. Uh, there's a, I should finish soon, but there, just an amusing sign that there's a language in, in, in Northern Ireland called Ullans. It's like, not, like Lowland Scots, it's kind of related to English. And very few people use it at this stage. So, but signs were put up because uh, there was a certain amount of provision for Irish in Northern Ireland under the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. They provide money for theatre and books and publishing and everything in Irish. They have to provide something for the Protestant side, so for this Ullans language. But there were signs put up in East Belfast in Ullans. Within two hours, the local Protestant extremists had destroyed all the signs because they assumed that there were signs in Irish. They just looked at these signs. They're not English, therefore they must be Irish. Therefore, let's destroy them right away. So they destroyed all the signs, even though the signs were in Ullans in, in what was supposed to be their, their own language, but they didn't recognize it. And they destroyed them right away because they said they didn't want signs in Irish. So it's a, there's an incredible hatred of Irish up there. And, and uh, I, it's, it's hard to understand why they can hate a language so much, but they do. Um, so it's probably, uh, I've said enough at this stage. Uh, we might have time for a question or two, but otherwise, thank you very much for all your attention. <laughs> Any question? It's improved a lot, a lot, actually. The, the Queen of England visited Dublin in 2011, and uh, she did two things, two symbolic things. First of all, she used the Irish language, she, just a sentence, but she used it and, and she pronounced it well. She clearly had, had prepared it well. She surprised people uh, that she used the sentence in Irish and used it in good Irish. And in fact, there was some, there was a guy called Gay Byrne, who's a very popular te television personality, he was on TV in 30 years. I never heard him using a word of Irish in the 30 years he was on TV, until the Queen of England used the sentence of Irish. The following day, he was on television and he did a bilingual program. He actually was a fluent speaker of Irish, but because the Queen of England hadn't used it, he wouldn't use it either. But as soon as the Queen of England uses Irish, he feels, no, I know I have a license to use it. So he started, he showed everybody to their amazement that he was a fluent speaker of Irish and he'd hidden it for all these years. So that shows the kind of the influence of the Queen of England. This is one thing she did was she used the sentence in Irish. The other thing she did was there were two graveyards in Dublin, two major graveyards. One is for the Irish who died in the British Army. A lot of Irish, Irish people joined the British Army in World War I and they're buried in Island Bridge and in Dublin. There's another graveyard then for the rebels who fought in the, the rebellion of 1916. They died fighting against her. The Queen of England visited both, uh, both graveyards, but she visited the, the rebel graveyard first. And she visited the rebel graveyard and she laid a wreath of flowers and bowed her head before the tombs of the, the Irish rebels, those who had fought fighting against her army. So this is a, a huge symbolic effect. It was like she said that for 750 years, we were wrong and you guys were right. We were wrong to invade your country. You were right, you have a right to be free. You are free. Sorry that we made you fight for 750 years for this. But eventually, we got a queen who we recognized. And she made a speech saying that we did a lot of things over the centuries which were wrong, which could have been done differently, or perhaps shouldn't have been done at all. Like the famine, for instance. <laughs> they could have prevented the famine, but they didn't. So I mean, that, that was really an, under, an understatement. But, so relations have improved a lot. And since Tony Blair was, pre was prime minister, he was a very fair-minded prime minister. I mean, he actually, in 1997, he apologized formally to the Irish people for the famine. 150 years later, the famine was the worst year of the famine in 1847. So in 1997, 150 year anniversary of the worst year of the famine. Most people died in Ireland in, in uh, 1847, about a million people died. Certainly in parts of the country in the West, 
over 90% of the people died of hunger in Mayo County. Only 1% in Wexford, in the English-speaking part, only 1% died of hunger in, in uh, Mayo, over 80%, the West Irish-speaking part of the country. So it was the poorer people and those who spoke Irish who died far more. Um, so, uh, but Tony Blair came along 150 years later and, and apologised formally. He said that we should have prevented the famine. We had the resources to prevent the famine. We didn't do it. We allowed you to die of hunger. We shouldn't have done that. It was wrong. We had to wait 150 years for this former apology from a British Prime Minister, but it arrived. A lot of the Irish said, well, we had to wait a long time for it, but at long last it came and got an apology 150 years later for what was com clearly completely wrong. But we had to wait so long for it, and Tony Blair was the first to do it. So, I mean, because of these gestures, uh, the, the relationship has improved a, a lot, uh, I would say. That, that there's a lot less hatred, a lot less... Uh, um, Brexit is difficult. I won't start speaking about Brexit because we'll be here for another hour, but uh, that, 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 that complicates things again. But I mean, relationships have improved uh, a lot. And the possibility to unite uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland. It may unite because of Brexit. I mean, the people of Northern Ireland voted 56% against Brexit. They voted to stay in the European Union. Scotland voted 62% to stay in the European Union. So, I mean, Nobody knows what will happen. They, they want to go ahead with Brexit on the end of October, 31st of October. If they leave without an agreement, uh, it will be very difficult in Ireland because it will re-establish a border in Ireland between us and Northern Ireland. And for 20 years, we've had no border. People have forgotten where there was a border. It's, it's one united all-Ireland economy. So I think what, what Boris Johnson would like, I suspect in any case what he would like is that to have an election where he would stand for Brexit. And Brexit is very popular in England. He would win the election. At the moment, he's depending on the 10 Protestants from Northern Ireland, the 10 DUP extremists, really. If you win the election in England, an overall majority, then he can drop the 10 in Northern Ireland. He says he doesn't really, not very, very interested in Northern Ireland anyway. What he would do then, he said, said OK, Britain leaves, and we have the customs, customs border will be between the two islands. So that Northern Ireland stays in the European Union. There's no need for a border in Ireland. Now, that would, that would please the majority of people in Northern Ireland. The majority don't want a border. It would really drive the Democratic Unionist Party would be, would be really angry. But nobody else would be. All the parties in Northern Ireland uh, campaigned to stay in the European Union, except this one party, this Democratic Unionist Party. They're the only party who wanted to, to leave. And they know very little about economics, because economically, it's, it's one island. And economically, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, exports going south of the border. A border just slows everything up. It works far better without a border. But um, England really wants to leave. They want a customs. They want to leave the customs union. They want to leave the single market. So you have to have a customs border somewhere. So the obvious thing then would be to have it in the Irish Sea, but that probably more and more they're beginning to discuss Irish unity now. For I, I, I believe for a long time it wouldn't happen in my lifetime, but in the last three years since Brexit, it's begun, begun, even by moderate unionists in the north are beginning to discuss that, say, let's, let's talk about this. We could somehow have a kind of a federal arrangement that we retain our own parliament in Northern Ireland and we have a, a federal situation because they really want to stay in the European Union. They don't want to leave, just like Scotland. And it could create an independent Scotland as well. Uh, so it's a, it could have huge consequences, uh, the whole Brexit situation. I think we have, we have a full hour used there. Thank you very much for your attention. Eh?